Finance Committee to order. Uh, second. Okay, is the minutes. Um, anybody have any corrections or additions? Uh, Christine and then David. Um, the end of the um, first page on natural resources, the second to last sentence. Um, the DPW is not asked for holiday lights for Uncle Sam Plaza, but there is funding that could be spent for it. So what? It is, it is funding. It is funding. It is funding. Okay, so Uncle Sam Plaza lights are can be covered in the budget. Yeah, the, 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 we have enough money in the holiday lighting line. Thank you. To cover it. Actually, you could just redo the sentence. Or put out not asked for, but just say the DPU bu budget has sufficient monies to cover the Uncle Sam Plaza or something like that. All right. And there's a, uh, on the next page, the top of the next page, um, there's a sentence that's repeated. DPW recommended budget. Oh, you yeah. have. Oh. Isn't it two different budgets? Okay, you know. I want to make sure they got that straight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just a minor adjustment. Uh, Article 34, the Minuteman School, in the second line, uh, budget increases are driven by a new, a new. Oh. Uh, that could be adjusted by a, by a new, a new. Thank you. Okay, close up. Anything else? <laughs> Charlie? I just have a little confusion in the Minuteman section here. It says uh, <coughs> the design enrollment decision is scheduled for August. I thought that the permanent, not the permanent, but the Minuteman School Building Committee voted for an 800 person school. Who's made, who is the design decision that's scheduled for August? I don't recall. You mean since the, our meeting? No, before. You said they were carrying forward uh, several designs. Charlie, I think he said ultimately the school committee will have a vote on that. I'm not sure if, if is it is the target. This is by the school committee? The Minuteman School Committee. Okay, so the design enrollment decision by the Minuteman School I Committee think so. is scheduled for August. Okay, okay. okay. I'm sort of confused by the next sentence. He estimates the cost to a medium Arlington oh, household. Yeah. At under a hundred dollars. I'm just not sure if people yeah. know H H right. means household. I, I can spell yeah. it. Okay, spell it out. Okay. okay. It should be hundred dollars per year for for twenty years. Yeah. Yeah. You should say so annual cost. Yeah. One hundred dollars per year over what was it thirty years, I think. Thirty? Yeah. Wow. Okay, are there any other changes? Okay, do I have a motion as corrected? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as corrected, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Okay. Come in. Okay, the, the, the sheet that's being handed out now was handed out at the Budget and Revenue Task Force. Um, and it basically explains the logic and the numbers for the uh, recommendation for the, that the Long Range Planning Committee and the Budget and Revenue Task Force made on the school budget. Um, if there's a couple extra, we've got four more members back there. So you can pull us in the budget. Just being passed around.
Okay, so you could just see the three and a half percent increase in the general education, the seven percent on the special, the <coughs> kindergarten fee offset, which continues, uh, and then the growth factor on the schools, just so you can see how the numbers work together. Okay, the school people yeah. ready? Okay, I think they can speak from the, from back there. Okay, the, the, the room is a little small for everybody as far as this is concerned. So, uh, uh, who's ever speaking could sort of stand up in that corner, and I think that will be okay. okay. Uh, so, the, the uh, hearing today is on the Arlington Public Schools budget. Uh, we have a handout here that, uh, uh, so who's ever going to open up the speakers uh, for the school? Uh, Dr. Bodhi? Right there. So the camera's on you. I know you're not used to that. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, this presentation is actually going to have three people as part of it. So when their piece of it comes up, I'll have them come and introduce themselves. But I don't know if you've ever met uh, Dr. Laura Chesson, who is the assistant superintendent. And she's going to talk tonight um, on technology and technology infrastructure. You do have um, a handout this evening, and uh, I wish we could have a PowerPoint, but I know that you're constrained in this in this uh, this room to actually have it for people who are watching this evening. But I will say that tomorrow we'll have the PowerPoint um, online if anybody would like to see any of the graphs. Well, first of all, uh, let me introduce some of the people that are here from the school department. Members of the school committee, we have. Uh, Gordon O'Kane, Paul Clifton, Jeff Gilman, Cindy Starr, Judge Pierce, and some other people who wanted to come and were unable to do that. The budget process in the school department starts actually last year. It really starts in the spring and has a, a very a robust discussions about the budget in the summertime. You can see the uh, the outline. This is not something that's new to the committee. I, I know that. Um, we had a vote of the school committee on March 17th. I'm sorry, that's you. March 13th for the school committee last week in terms of moving the budget from the proposed book, uh, superintendent budget to the school committee budget. And in the next slide that you have, you can see the, all of the <coughs> participants in the development of this budget, which includes all of our principals, curriculum leaders, the school committee, and, and uh, the, uh, the school committee, the budget subcommittee, which is very much involved in the process throughout the fall, as you will know. And in the next couple of slides, for those of you that may not know some of the names of our principals at each elementary school, as well as members of central office, as well as curriculum leaders, you'll find those names on the next couple of slides. So giving you a, I'm now on page eight. So giving you a, uh, uh, just a very broad stroke, stroke look at the FY14 year to date, uh, I think one of the big highlights, of course, this year is that we were able to open the Thompson um, Elementary School this year um, on time and, very importantly, to all of you, under budget. And it is beautiful. And I think everyone agrees that it was one of our uh, great accomplishments in the last uh, couple of years as a community. Another important thing that you should be aware of is that the special education budget is being about $1.2 million over budget, but that 
that amount will be covered by reserves. One of the sources of the reserves is going to be the $500,000 stabilization account that was set up a couple of years ago by town meeting that we have a warrant article asking for the use of those funds this year. Another important um, implementation this year was the new teacher evaluation system, which has involved um, a considerable amount of our professional development. It's a, it's a very much of a change in how we have been doing practice, the practice of evaluations. It's a much more in time intensive process um, than it has been in the past. And then the other, the other important part with respect to our budget is that the other parts of the budget are remaining within these expected <coughs> parameters. We want to talk a little bit about special <coughs> education because that seems to be, that is the, um, the um, area of our budget which is now uh, over budget. And looking at a year to date results and looking at um, where the sources of the overage are lie. So the education, special education service budget is, is uh, approximately 6.8% above budget, or 13.1% above the FY13 actual expenses. And the, the source of the overage um, is, is prob primarily about two thirds of that amount is due to out of district placements. We've had a number of students that have had hospitalizations, and 47% of the, of the outplacements that we've had this year have been due to um, prior hospitalizations. At the beginning of the school year, we had 102 students that were out of district. Presently, we have 112. And many of those are what we call 45-day placements, which is, is not an uncommon type of placement after um, a hospitalization. When needed. And not, not everyone that's hospitalized comes back and has a out-of-district out placement. I don't want to say that. But what I am saying is that in terms of the seven or eight hundred thousand dollars that we are over budget, roughly half of that is due to placements as a result of hospitalizations. We've also seen a major jump in contracted services in a couple of areas. One is in vision services at the preschool level. What we're starting to see in our preschool and certainly as, our, as well as our kindergarten are the results of a lot of medical interventions that have had very small weight children, children that are under three pounds, being able to survive and, um, and, and thrive. But often these children um, require uh, additional services in, the er in areas of vision and hearing. And we have had um, more, more use of contracted services in that area than we have in past years. We're also seeing a need for uh, behavioral interventions um, for a growing number of students that require, require um, plans to help them learn to be self-regulated in school. We see a lot more at younger ages, children um, manifesting anxiety disorders, and so we've had more contracted services in that area. And as our, as our out of district placements increase, not only, the, not only do the tuitions uh, are, are part of our, our overage, but as well as the transportation costs for the students. At this point, I would like to have Diane come up and talk a little bit about um, these next two graphs because one of the questions I know that is on almost all of your minds is um, part of our agreement with respect to the budget is that we have a 7% increase in special education costs as part of our plan and I know that many of you are wondering whether that number is really true to the tr true costs that we're seeing every year and these two, two next graphs probably Will, will help you understand that, in fact, that is the case. And I saw there was a question coming. Could we finish the whole presentation, or would you prefer to have questions? Well, I was thinking that, uh, that we should probably take questions as we go through sort of each section. Um, and, uh, you know, so as long as we're on special education, um, you know, I have a question just on the hospitalization uh, as far as why that happens. In other words, you're not paying for the hospitalization. No. 
on. So, so what is happening in that process? Somebody goes into a hospital and then comes out and all of a sudden their special education costs increase? They, they may or may not be on an, um, an IEP, but they may need to be on an uh, edu individual education plan following that. It could be that they have um, extended time evaluation to see what kind of um, what kind of services they might need in returning to the school or what kind of services they might need in order to be able to um, access the curriculum. So I would say that a fair number of these are out of district placements for short term placements. So some are not. And they 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 vary. We have had um, we have ten students in residential placements right now, and the ten that we have right now are not the same ten that we had last year. So there is a little bit of um, fluidity in terms of those placements. Okay, does anybody have just on this issue, Carol? So we end up paying for the residency rather than their health insurance, that residency placement? We pay for the educational component of it. Uh, but let me just say this. Are you talking about residential or are you talking about... Um, residential, like you said, there are 10 students last year and 10 students this year. I would say that... Um, it, varies. it varies. We varies. have yeah. um, Some of the students um, may be DCF children. In which case, DCF would pay the housing portion and pay the educational portion. Yes. In other cases, we bear the entire cost of the residential placement. So, well, we're on a topic of special ed. You had mentioned, um, so you're talking about being over our budget this year and using money from a reserve fund to offset the costs. Um, so there's always good news and bad news to the reserves funds, right? You're, you're happy they're there, right? So you say, wow, they're here. We're going to get through FY14. Right. But then they're, they're gone. And then they're gone. Right. Yeah. It's, exactly. Based on the way you started shaking your head, you knew where I was going when I started, so it kind of made me laugh. Um, so what do you think? I mean, I well, guess. Diane knows I've said all year, as we've been seeing these increases growing, that I mean, I would like not to be able not to touch all of the money in that stabilization account, but the, the issue is that we, we need to um, be able to cover all of these costs. We right, have other but you, so let me ask you this question, this really gets to the heart of the matter, is you're saying you're going to spend about 500000 I think you said, from the stabilization, stabilization fund. How much, is that the whole balance? It's the whole balance of that stabilization account. We also have a tuition in account, but we've been fortunate enough to be able to carry the balance in that. It's a revolving account. And that's just over $500,000 now. We'll probably use all of that. We also have $150,000 credit with the lab collaborative that we'll be able to use. And we have other, um, we have other funds available in reserves based on our foreign visa students who pay tuition to come to Arlington. And we would plug the difference with that. Those funds aren't specific to, to special education. All the other, all the other sources I've listed are specific to special education. Right, but what I, what I guess I'm getting at, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around it, is I mean, sort of. I mean, we talked about some prior years, right? The the, the 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 large challenge with schools is that your, your budget is fixed, determinable, and set on September one. There's really no way out of it, right? It's not like you can. Lay teachers, well, you guess you could lay teachers off a million, but we're not going to go that way, right? So you start, whatever you, your budget is, what it is in September when you have very little room. If you get to a city and you have these reserves, you kind of hope at the end of the day you can partially drain them down. But you're, what you're saying is we're in a situation where we're just going to blow, we have to, we're, we're in a, you're in a situation where you've got to blow them all. Well, that's all, no. the special, all the specific special ed reserves, that's correct, but there remains one other reserve. If I can go on to the next slide, I think I can make this a little more clear. Um, okay. yeah. this, slide, this slide here, the funds at the bottom in dark green are the amount of grant funds that are expended on special education, showing three years of actuals, the FY14 projections as of January, so they're a little lower than they are now, and the FY15 budget. The light green is circuit breaker. And if you look at FY11, our circuit breaker <coughs> is very small. In FY11, we only, we only spent half of our circuit breaker that we received in FY11 we pushed the other half of it to FY12. And in FY12, that was a very good year relative to spend expenditures, and we were able to subsist on only the other half of the FY11 circuit breaker, and to put the $500,000 into the town stabilization. 
That allowed us to push an entire year, FY12's entire year of circuit breaker to FY13. And so now we're in a very advantageous situation where the money we spend in, in a given year for circuit breaker is funds we collected in the prior year. So, as we go into FY15, although we will not have the town stabilization for special ed, the tuition in revolving account for special ed, nor the lab credit, because they'll all have been expended, if we needed to, we will still we will have all of the amount we counted on for circuit breaker, and we will be collecting more circuit breaker that year. Now that would really be eating our seed money for the next year, which would be very bad, but we do have it, so we're not completely without reserves. I would just prefer not to see that happen. That would be the last reserve I would want to hit, but I want you to know that we're not completely to the bond in that respect. Okay. Now on that issue, um, Article 7 of the Special Town Meeting has a transfer from the Education Stabilization Fund. How much are you requesting? We're going to request all of the 500000 Okay, so the, it's 500000 in there now? Okay, so 500000 from the Stabilization Fund under Article 7. Okay. Any other questions on this? Charlie? May I? Um, I look at this chart. Uh, there's no page number here. The one that says special education expense by funding source? Yes. yes. Okay. So that's your total special education expense, right? Correct. So uh, I've calculated this a couple of times from different ways. It looks to me like it's a seven, you know, the compound growth rate is 7%. Well, if we go to the next slide, yeah. um, this is, if this line is all, is all special ed funding from all funding sources, the flip side is just the special ed funding that comes from the town appropriation. The dark green is the amount the school department has expended or plans to expend that's appropriation from the town appropriation. The light green, starting in FY12, is the amount of money that the town has appropriated specifically for special education. And you see in the first year, FY12, <coughs> we expended more out of appropriation money than we received. In the second year, the opposite is true. In FY14, we expended more than we received, and in 15, we're projecting it for, for it to reverse again. If you look at the very bottom line of the numbers, the, the four-year over-under is the 27874 So this shows what our actual expenditures are out of town appropriation funding relative to the 7% growth that we get from the town appropriation. And as you see, it's a very close on. And what this does, what this graph does, is it neutralizes any shifting effects of circuit breaker. I mean, it's basically backed out circuit breaker. It's backed out grants funding. So we need that 7% because the grants and the circuit breaker don't make up the difference in all of our growth. Yeah. Anybody else, Trump? Uh, in years past, uh, I, I got increasingly frustrated with the costs of, of, of transporting kids out of, out of the town. And it seemed to me that after a while, the school system got that under control, and you were doing very well, and I was quite pleased about that. But it seems like it's returning somehow here. And the question I have, I guess, with, and I want to say this as kindly as I can, uh, it, it, did that go awry, or what's happened to the process by which you were able to control it before, and maybe it's gotten out of hand now? We're still using the Lab Edco Collaborative for our out-of-district transportation costs, and that's a very good plan because it's, several districts collaborate, and so vans can travel full instead of half empty. And so we have realized good cost savings. The cost of transportation does go up over time, and we're still part of that collaborative. But what happens is we start the beginning of the year, we give them all our runs, we give them all of our students, you know, the prices are all allocated. But if you add a student mid-year and there aren't available vehicles in the collaborative, you have to add a vehicle. And so that's why this year has been particularly rough because we've had more students rolling in later and very often placed differently. The other pressure on transportation is homeless, over which we have little to no control. I have to praise our transportation director, Rick Ionelli. He does a tremendous job. He makes competitive calls, but there are so few vendors out there anymore that want to do homeless or special ed transportation, other than the big concerns that are going for things like the collaborative, <coughs> that when you have one or two kids 
going from here to Chelsea or Boston to here, and you have to put them on a van and you have no choice, the costs really start to escalate. So insofar as possible, we're continuing to cooperate with this collaborative. It's a great effort. It's become a model for other parts of the state. But homeless is, is a really tough one. And Rick does, Rick does a heck of a job. But you know these are mandated things. So, so, so the impression I'm getting in the illustration in this graph here is that this sort of goes up and down for you. This is not a long-term trend. And you, you think you'll be able to hold it to the 7 percent or something. I have to say, frankly, the number of uh, the rising number of homeless is surprising. You know, the economy the economy is better now. I would have expected to see that level off, but this year is not. I have to dig into that more thoroughly to have a better understanding of why that's so. Thank you. Well, well not, not all students that are designated as homeless in our rosters are requiring a ban to some other community. We have we have homeless students that live right here in Arlington because they may be living with a relative or a friend and they're still designated as homeless. So the, the numbers may belie the um, actual number of children traveling out of town. True. So the kids who qualify as homeless are kids who were in our school system at one point and become homeless, which is why they're commuting to, say, Chelsea? Well, they may, they, may live in, they may originally come from Chelsea, be placed in a group home shelter in Arlington, but being transported back to Chelsea to continue school so their education is disrupted. Or they might be an Arlington student who is now become homeless for some reason and is living in some other place and is being transported back to Arlington to continue their, their schooling. And the whole point of the homeless is to help a homeless child be as least disrupted as possible. Right. But it, it's very expensive and, it, and it's a it's supposed to be a 50-50 cost share between the two districts involved. And the management of this is, as you can imagine, quite nightmarish. And Rick Ionelli does a great job of really staying on top of it. Okay, Dick. Uh, she just to answer that question. Did we half and half reimbursement? Well, we half and half. And any reimbursements come through the state funding and come to the the long range. You get state the funding. Line. You get state funding on this. Yeah, but it, it comes to the town, and, like Chapter 70, yeah, it goes to the bottom line. If that half comes from the receiving town? Yeah, it's supposed to. Can you collect it? Uh, Rick tries to set it up so that the vendor bills directly half and half. Oh. I mean, you know, we try to keep as few checks flying around as possible. Okay, Charlie? So, um, Diane, I'm a little confused by the numbers. These charts we just saw tonight for the first time. And, um, you know, the, you sent us a table last week. Mm -hmm. And thank you for doing that. Um, and I, I looked at. I assume those numbers are the same. I mean, I haven't. I they're going to look a little different because of the way they're configured. That table I sent you last week, and, and I had trepidation about. Well, can I finish my question? Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think that um, you know I looked at I looked at these numbers in the individual categories, and I looked at them in the total uh, in, in, the, in the total expenses. And when I did a 10-year compounded growth analysis on this, uh, it generally came out, you know, around 7%. Um, when I looked at a five-year growth rate, uh, it came out almost two percentage points lower, somewhere, you know, around 4 or 5% compounded growth. But your chart is only four years. So I'm trying to understand um, are, you know, what are we looking at and why here, and are we comparing consistent set of numbers to a consistent set of numbers? There, are, there is one discrepancy right off the bat. This five years starts in FY11, and so if you use the other chart ended, the final year and the other chart was 14, not 15, and so that's part of the anomaly right there. I'm looking in this chart from 11 to 15, and the other chart it was from 05 to 14. So that's, that's one of the differences. The other difference is in the chart that you're holding in your hand right now, this is only appropriation dollars. I've backed out grant funding and I have backed out certain breaker. Whereas in the other chart they are in. So what my so I you know if I look at the chart that you gave us on the on the weekend, or before the weekend, um, you have expenses of uh, internal instruction services, which I believe is the SPED program that's 
locally administered, right, in the school, in the school system. And then you have um, payments to other districts. To other districts. I assume that's out, you know, all of this residential and out of district costs, etc. Correct? No, it is not, because those those numbers do not reflect grant funding that could have funded either or both of those concerns. The purpose of that chart was back. No, no, wait, let me ask. Let me ask a question then. Um, Aren't expenses expenses? I mean, independent of where the money comes from, there should be expenses that are expenses, and then you have another basket that's revenue. The difference here is that when I came to Arlington, I was asked to reconstruct a long-range view of expenditures that had happened. I had, because there had been multiple changes in the chart of accounts, I had no way with Arlington's internal records to do that year-over-year -year comparison. So I went back to the state and I got the numbers from the state that had been submitted on the end of the year report and reconstructed it using those numbers. The state does not collect information on special education expenditures when they're funded by grants or circuit breaker. And so the numbers you're looking at are basically just what the state considers general fund. And so that is not a good graph to use for the kind of analysis you're trying to do. I, but I wanted to phase it out. But I felt it still had value because it talks about the change in population over time, and it talks about the bottom line number over time, and I think it is a valuable view. But when you start looking at categories, it is not a valuable view. Okay. This so, afternoon, so I sent you back, a different let me, set let me of go back to the, to, Then let me ask the question. I'm still trying to understand this. If it's looking at the bottom line number over time, let's see if I can read this. The um, total of FY14 on that should match perfectly the FY14 number here. Right, but the the ten year compound growth rate is seven point four percent, which argues in favor of your seven point you know your seven percent growth number. But the five year growth rate is five point five percent. And that's FY ten through FY fourteen. Right. Okay. I'm looking at it FY And FY fifteen, 15 is, is a smaller jump mm -hmm. than than the normal seven percent. So the, you know the conclusion that I came to was that the administration is doing a good job in controlling costs. Try real hard. So, what I, so the, my question in taking a long-term view, trying to take a long-term view, are we dealing with a 7% growth rate or are we dealing with a lower growth rate? Because if you take the, you know, if you take one year, one year you have a 13% jump or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But if you take all the years, and in fact, I think it was either last year or the year before, and I have a question about this, when the, when the school department had a big savings in, special education and put the money into normal academic channels. So um, what, are, what are we dealing with here in terms of growth of the special education class? I believe, I believe this is a, really, is a really good way to look at it because it gets the clouding factors of grants and the circuit breaker out of the equation. It looks at how much appropriation money from the town of Arlington is being spent on special education up against how much money from the appropriation dedicated to special education is being allocated. So we're comparing the revenue stream for spend to the expenditures in the same source from spend. And so, I would argue that 7% is the right number because the over under over time, over the four years that I can do this data, is very close to even. Now obviously if you pick different points in time, you're going to get slightly different results. But I only have, you know, we only started this in FY12 where we had a specific revenue stream dedicated to special ed. I'm, I'm asking the question about the aggregate expenses. And while there are subcategory expenses you said here in this chart that you sent us are not correct, you believe that the totals are correct. Yes. So the total says that the last five years are 40% lower than the previous five years. I think your assessment that we're trying to re reduce costs, which because back 10 years ago we were seeing increases in, in the neighborhood of 10 percent. We have made a concerted effort to do this, but even doing that, you're going to have years where they spike, come down, and, and this year we're going to, that's going to happen. I understand. I'm yeah. just trying to establish whether I believe what I read or I don't believe what I read. And what I've read and what I can count is that this last five, according to this chart, through fiscal year 14, is that what this is? Yes, it's year 14. Um, the, the second five years are 
a lower growth rate than the prior five years. I think that's good. Which is a, I'm not saying anything about the variability. I totally agree that the variability is $2 million or more, but, but, the, but the, the trend line is going in the right direction. Correct. So too. We hope so. Well, can I, hmm? I, I now I guess I'm lost. Um, I thought I wasn't lost because if I look at this chart, I believe what this is what you're saying is sort of an incomplete chart because this is a measure of special education costs funded by the general fund. Because what, what, then let me just tell you what I did. I took your town appropriation for special ed 15 two eight six four four eight. Okay, an FY14, and I took out my budget book and just tied it to the number in the budget. So that works, right? Mm -hmm. And then it shows a deficit of 276,000. But we started off this discussion talking about a much larger special edu education deficit than 276,000. Correct. And so Correct. the remainder of the deficit is caused by expenditures that are not here because they're not funded by the general fund, they're funded by other sources. Correct. And that's where I think the challenge is becoming and looking at this because my head started to spin at that point as well. That's very true. Um, and that's where the other chart, which while confusing its specificities, has a bottom line number that captures revenue from all sources. It so, expenses yeah. from related to those sources. Correct. So I mean there's it's a very complex thing, and to get a good read on it, it's, there's no one right way to or there's no one best way that I've discovered yet. To capture it in its entirety. I thought this was an important analysis to look at to see what was the relationship of funds, general funds expended for special education concerns versus what was special, which was general fund funds allocated for special education concerns. And I think this tells us that 7% is right on. Stephen? Yeah, just a question given the numbers that are going around, Dana, on, on page nine, could you tell us where? What numbers, the 6.8% and the 13.1% um, increases are, are taken from, and that's the special ed projected above budget by 6.8% in fiscal 14, or 13.1% above fiscal 13 actual expenses. Mm -hmm. What numbers for the 13.1, for example, because when I add up the totals, I, I get a higher number, so I, I must be pulling the wrong numbers. Sit in my chair and play the calculator and come back and answer. Okay. Okay. Charlie? Just a follow-up follow question. Um, I think I think it was last year that um, we had a situation where the special education expenditures came in under the forecast by some amount. I can't remember exactly what it was. In in the uh, but the money was spent. I was at the time I was told that the money was spent in the normal academic curriculum uh, quote unquote in intervention areas that would eventually benefit the uh, special education and I, I think I think it was three or four percent under you know it was a substantial substantial difference so um, my question is um, in this chart where you show these surpluses and negative amounts here at the bottom, the difference. Uh, are you counting the money that you spent already in a different category? I mean, how could you have this positive balance if you spent it in a different category? Because I, all that, that differential is the difference between what the town allocated for spend and what we expended out of the general fund for spend. Okay, but you don't still have that money. No. Because it was spent somewhere else. Yes. So the, the, the okay. So this is a this is sort of a theoretical number based on 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 the. It's the difference between those two things between the revenue stream dedicated to spend and the expenditures out of the general fund. So in in that case, um, in, in practice, you're eight hundred thousand dollars under, right? You, because the five hundred thousand is gone, so you're really looking at. 560 and 276. Is that a, it's a different direction, sir. Yeah. He's adding up uh, FY12 yeah. and FY14. I know, I know he's doing That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't follow I don't, I don't understand. If, if 
I remember correctly, last the, the issue that was raised last year was, was special ed was pretty much level funded. Um, going into this with funds and intervention, but that was for this fiscal year. So now I think what they've discovered is that all of a sudden in fiscal 14, instead of having almost a level of expenditures, the expenditures have skyrocketed mm -hmm. um, to the point where they need to scramble to get more money. So they were, they budgeted at a level, but the expenditures aren't appearing at a level. Last year, my memory was it's like six, was like 0.2 percent under the seven percent was a very small number and yes we did I do recall that discussion you're talking about intervention <coughs> in fact there's a chart in here that will show you what part of the uh, of the budget is spent on intervention which you might want to talk a little bit about this in terms of what the categories are that the that the state uses because while the money that we invest in math intervention, reading, literacy interventions um, certainly keep down the <coughs> referrals. And by the way, even though this is actually a very, a very interesting thing relative to this issue, our actual percent of referrals has been level or slightly going down, yet we're seeing an increase in the actual cost of student out of district. So the interventions actually are having a very positive effect in our total expenditures for special education because we are not seeing referrals we may have seen um, in the early, 10 years ago in terms of percentage. It has come down considerably. Uh, and those those numbers are not are not captured um, other than in a, in a separate category. They're not part of what the uh, they considered the special education costs. And more about that. Yeah, um, reading it, I mean, for example, um, Dr. Chesson gave me the numbers just today that of our reading specialists, who we do not count as a special ed cost, five full time FTEs serve no one but specialized kids. And so it would be entirely valid to say that those five FTEs in reading are legitimate special ed costs. But I didn't want to do apples and oranges. I didn't want to chop and change. I wanted to stick with a consistent definition of spend so we can see trends over time and not muddy the waters with those kinds of ins and outs. Okay, Paul. So on this chart of the first chart of special education expense by funding source, um, is the is the extra five hundred thousand that you're taking out of reserves? One of these included in one of these numbers? I'm projecting that this is what our expenses are. Um, okay, so then on the... And in fact, I think, my, I think these projections are based on the projections I did when I did the budget book in January. So I think the, the deficit is projected lower at this time because more information is unfolded in the subsequent two months. So these numbers tie to what's in your budget book. And so, so this, these projections are short of the 1.2 that we're talking about tonight. Because at the time these numbers were put together, it was a different picture. So both the, well, so the total expenditure is short. And that difference is not included in what's listed as the town. Well, because location. it won't be coming out of the town's location. No. So the, the 500000 that you're going to get out of the stabilization fund is not included here as a funding source? It is not yet, because we don't have it yet. Okay. Okay, uh, Al? Yes, one of my questions, the, the, on the second chart, the, the town appropriated for special ed, does that include the money appropriated to the uh, stabilization fund? No. No, so perhaps I should have put that in there. In um, FY12. And, and the request will drain down the stabilization fund. It will. What's the mechanism to replenish the stabilization fund? Stabilization fund's a good idea because of the, your, your fluctuations. What's the mechanism to replenish the stabilization fund? Well, I'm hoping, you know, is you have a budget that does that, you have to budget for worst case scenario. And I'm hoping that the tide will turn, and that'll be the point where we can replenish, that we'll be at the end of the year with a surplus, and that will be the point to move, move the stabilization, move money back into the stabilization at town meeting. I think what Charlie said was that there was money not spent in special education that was reallocated to other educational programs. But if that if it happens again, that there's a surplus of special education, instead of doing that, it would go back to the 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Brian. Um, getting back to your point where we thought it was pretty much flat last year. This is the budget book from last year, and it's almost flat. And the numbers changed slightly for this year. But the problem I'm having is the numbers are moving on a, and I'm sure they are on a regular basis. I'm just looking to lay out as Charlie had it. The revenues are the revenues. The expenses are the expenses. We don't necessarily care if this dollar paid for this expense because we can track it. But if we're trying to track that dollar to this dollar, it can't be done. At least it can't. I don't think it can be done by you. It certainly can't be done by us. Uh, is there anywhere that just has the budget straightforward? Because I've gone through, I have the last three budget years here, and none of these things tie out. At, if you look at section, if you look at section, I believe it is 10 this year. That's, what, that's the bottom line of 10. And here's this, this year. This is FY14. You're right, and this is FY15. But FY14 is almost flat. But expenditure, expenditure, budget, projection. Right. You see where I scratched off the budget and what was there so the proposal that's the expense projection right that's different than the budget okay what's the bu what's the budget amount there i don't have it in front of me 17040801 and what's the proposed really what's the proposed budget the following year it's comparing the years the two years that's what we're trying to do at least i think we're trying to do so you're trying to look you're trying to look at the 13 budget versus the 14 budget and what you can do right honestly we're just trying to compare apples and apples that's all okay. we're really trying so to then, do so then you know what I'm trying to give you is the best picture I can of what's going on. And so where I have actuals, I will give them to you. So you have in this budget, well, I, two I, I, years of expenditures, one year of budget next to my projected expenditures, moving into level service, which picks up the step in lanes, changes to the budget and the proposed budget. I understand what the columns are. What I'm saying is the numbers between years didn't change significantly on that budget book. And, and there was a 7% increase that was given. That's the first thing. Then when I would look at this year's budget book, I would expect to see the same numbers that are there in this year's budget book as it rolls forward, and they're not the same. Well, because it's now actuals. 13 well, no, not just the one year. I'm talking about all, all the years. They're, they're, they're all, everything's it's changing a little bit. And what I'm saying, what I'm trying to get is, I'm trying to see on one spot where I can look and see the numbers that are historical, without them changing and or like I said I got three years worth of books here and none of them none of them agree well but you're comparing budgets to actuals uh, no I'm not historical I, I'm, but if you if you change if you check the historical what do you have for the historical on 2011 expenditures on that one 14199 here you got 14256 and it, that's five years later the numbers are changing I just I, I just don't understand well, I can I can explain it to you. That, okay. You know, there are great big pivot tables with thousands of lines, mm -hmm. and small anomalies will creep in. Okay. I mean, is that? Well, no. I was just trying to find it. So again, to compare apples and apples, and and the things are a move. They're a moving target in the current year, but they shouldn't be moving targets historically. I agree. I mean, you know, but I do my best. Well. It may, it, in some categories, it may seem as though the numbers have changed, because actually when we budget, we actually do it from actions, particularly for out-of-district. And um, we're able to have a fairly stable couple of years in a row, but next year's budget is going to come up to the of the uh, new actual. When we, get, when we get to it, I have more questions on, on this stuff, but not pertaining to this particular point. So when we get to it. <coughs> Okay, so, we're going to try. So uh, let, let me come back to this. So in section 10, you have, this is all expenditures, right? No revenue. Correct. So do you have, is this, so what I'm trying to understand is what, how does the internal curriculum, the internal uh, special education curriculum cost change, and how does the out of district, or, or let's say the outside, out of the school, uh, the, is that the detail is there, but it's very difficult to see. Late this afternoon, I sent you two other views. I also sent them to the other members that were on the email um, that show special ed expenditures over that same period of time. So actuals from 11, 12, 13, projections for 14, budget for 15. And it's, it's summarized by program category because that, that's the piece of the coding that distinguishes special ed from general ed and the general ed. And so you can see it summarized by 
preschool, OTPT, speech, um, residential day, all the uh, in-district special ed transportation, out-of-district transportation. I also sent you a different view that shows that by object category, for example, administrative salary, teacher salary, tuition costs, and it shows you the object subtotal broken out by program. So you would see tuition spent for preschool versus tuition spent for, you know, you'd be able to see it two ways. I think you have all the detail in that section, but it's very difficult to see because like the rest of the budget, it's broken out by cost center. So the two views I sent you, I think will be, will make it easier to look at those expenditures so over time. What is the, what is the actual, do you have anywhere in this report the, let me just use the term, out of district special education costs over years as a number? If you go to the object summary, which I think is section six, five or six, um, and you see it by, um, by object, if you look for tuition, it is called, it is called, let me get the right section for you. No, I'm sorry, it's section seven. Eight three two zero one tuition to other schools. So that shows the progression of out of district tuition, both day and residential, by the object code eight three two zero one tuition to other schools. And you can see it for 11, 12, 13. You can see the FY14 budget, the FY14 projected expenses as of January when I did this. The level service budget, where I've corrected for what I knew to be happening later in the budget process, carrying forward into the 15 proposed budget. Okay, so now if I take, let's see, I have this one right So if I look at these numbers, Diane, mm -hmm. um, I don't see the huge fluctuations that you're talking about in, and, and that's, you know, we have these variances in the budget that I've seen in other numbers that are a million and a half to two and a half million dollars in a year. These numbers, in this, in this, this, is, this is just tuition. It is, it, it, it was fairly flat in 12 and 13, but the 14 it took off again. It's five, six, six, three, six, two, six, three, six, six. Well, 6.6 six is too low because that was a projection done two months earlier. So it goes okay, up. Okay, well, let's skip that column. It's, it's, it's gone. It's, it's still. It's gone from 6.2 in actual FY13 to the the 14 budget of 6.3 to the 6.6 six mid-year projection to the 7.0, which I believe to be a more accurate projection because it has been evolving. We've added 40 other replacements in the last week. And that's just one piece of special education. I think the two reports I sent you by email will illustrate the variances in other areas of special education. Thank you. Okay, John, did you have a question? Uh, <coughs> I, no, I, I don't. Okay, Alan? Is the average per pupil cost in the special education programs, um, how fast is that increasing? I haven't looked at it that way because, you know, I don't, I don't believe that to be a very valuable metric. Well, the reason I, mean, I, I think <coughs> might be is the per pupil cost, yeah, a steady population, which one 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 is, uh, and then the, then the sort of baseline increase would be the, you know, per pupil cost increase. Uh, and there's some contributing factor the number of pupils decreases, but again, I would hope the number of pupils and their needs change over time, but sort of levels out. It was not not growing forever because I can expect the pupil cost would grow with some sort of inflation. That's why I'd like to see them call it a fixed American cost. Could, could you calculate the average per pupil, pupil cost that we're is there a I mean, if you done? take that the really long spreadsheet, you have the yeah. numbers of student of, of um, special ed students, and you can divide the total by the special. And you sent that out as a flyer. That, 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 yeah. that was one of the files. Excel file. Yeah, that was one of those files. 
But there, you know, the, I mean, when you think about SPEND, there really are different categories. There are, ki there are children in a general ed classroom receiving interventions. There are children in a substantially separate classroom, which are staffed at very different well, levels. In the long run, do those ratios change a lot? Do they, do well, I haven't, I haven't done that kind of analysis on it. But, I mean, you know, if you look at the cost of a residential student versus the cost of a uh, included student who receives some modest services, I mean, the cost differential is gargantuan. And so to average those two students doesn't seem to me to be a valuable measure. Well, and uh, again, I'm looking for sort of a base rate of increase versus one that's related to the fluctuation of other students who come down. But the student, I mean, the student fluctuations haven't been that drastic. I mean, we're, we've been going steadily up over the last several years and out of district placements. Okay. But the okay. total number of students has been sort of numbers. batting back and forth. Okay. Okay. Can you describe um, what programs you have in place either with the state or locally or with outside advisors to control the out-of-district costs? Um, the state sets the rates for the out-of-district schools. The school placements are decided through the IEP committee process, and we pay what they tell us to. Well, let me just ask you that. We belong to Collaborative, the Lab Collaborative. There are, there are five districts, I think, that you're aware of, all of the towns. But for those listening, we have Arlington, Lexington, Belmont, Burlington, and Bedford. Each one of these towns has one of the programs housed in their district. By doing that, is able to bring down the cost of each of the each of the lab programs that we make do an out of district placement. So one of the ways that you reduce out of district costs is to be <coughs> able to participate in these kind of collaborative programs. In fact, Edco is going to begin next year some out of district. Uh, programs as well, including the 45-day secondary program, which again will be below what you might get in a in a private uh, school. So, going through a collaborative programs is one way you bring the cost of of out of districts down. But of course, the other one is to invest in in-district programs so that the students can receive the services they need in district, and we have done that. And not to mention, which is also important is the kind of intervention programs that we do so the students do not have to be referred for additional services because they can get those services as part of the gen ed program and by doing that I, I, I think we've seen success in that in our number of referrals has remained fairly flat after some <coughs> in the last few years and so you have to look at it in terms of an investment as well in terms of what is going to provide the needed services before a student has to um, receive more intensive services. Do we have any, any way of, um, any metrics on the, the value received from these outside services? Well, one of the things that happens as part of an IEP meeting, that they certainly have annual, uh, and <coughs> perhaps even more often, reviews of student progress and that is something that's evaluated in a team meeting. But do we know that for example one school does better than another school for a given amount of money? We have some thoughts around that issue, yes. Um, but I would say that what we're looking for is student progress. We like objective measures of student progress and that is something that you look at in an IEP, in an IEP meeting. So one of the issues is if the student is not making effective progress, then we, might, we would perhaps suggest another study, which is coming back into the district in order to receive services here. So there are a number of students that come back into district um, in, in some ways, not only because they may not make effective progress, but also because they have made effective progress and they are ready for a more, um, in, uh, more um, inclusive environment for education. The, 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 the federal mandate and certainly the, uh, how we look at this is we want students to have education in the most least restrictive environment. And that's how it's defined. So the most least restrictive is to be in a general education classroom. And the goal is toward that, that goal. And to the extent that we can do that or keep students as possible in those in those um, classrooms and be making progress. It has to be both. We have to be able to have the students do that. 
So there is a lot of there is a lot of in and out that goes on within a district this size in terms of um, students and programs, and and but the goal is to make sure that they students get what they need because our foremost goal is to make sure that happens and have it in the most least restrictive. After a district program, the least restrictive would be lab because that is the program that is part of our district. And then beyond, and then it goes out from there. Can I make a comment? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Brody, I'd just like, like to say, first of all, I, um, in my looking at these numbers, as I said earlier, I do believe that the trend line on these costs are coming down. And I think that's to the credit of the school department. I, I don't know, I, I, I don't have my arms around the numbers enough. <coughs> They're not clear enough for me, but I, I think. You know, maybe that uh, some sort of uh, evaluation or audit on the outside expenses might you know, might be helpful to, to sort of continue to drive these in the, in the right direction, if it's possible. I also think that um, it might be a good idea if the school department could think about a lower growth rate on a special education over the long run, but a, a higher input to the reserve fund. So in, in other words, they, if, if, even if the, if the growth rate is trending down because of the management that you're doing, the variability is still there based on the incidental severity of cases or the, the population bouncing around. So that, that would mean that you, you need a larger reserve fund that we should try to build up over time, but you don't necessarily have to have as high a anticipated growth rate in the long run. And that's just my observation from the It, it may well be in a couple of years that we would feel more comfortable <coughs> given our actual expenses and what we see happening right now. Um, I don't believe that I feel comfortable changing the 7% given what I'm seeing here. When you look at five years and you're, you're over under on this, it's such a small number, it's, not, it's just more than one TA. It's, it's, pretty close, it's getting pretty close to that number. I totally agree with you that we need to build up our reserves, and that's a concern that going to the stabilization account this year. So our goal next year is to whatever we can, we want to be able to build some, some of those back up again with, with the hope that next year um, it, will be, uh, it will be different. And actually, there is a precedent when we look at long range in terms of special education costs over uh, 10 years. Shown you that chart before is we've never really seen to have a really um, finding a, a really large number followed by another year. I know, I, I know. So we're hoping that next year won't be quite, but we don't know. Because one of the things that we're also seeing, which is a, a trend we're trying to understand a little bit better too, is that many more of our out of district are happening at the secondary level, not necessarily at the elementary. Um, so we were looking at our programs at the, at the secondary level in terms of what, what we might need to do in shoring them up or changing some programs um, as we go forward. Our, element, our elementary programs seem to be doing um, quite well in addressing some of these issues. There are going to be some students that it's just simply not cost effective as much as we would like to be able to have them in district, as much as their parents would like to have them in district, it may not be cost effective in terms of the services that we can offer. And so there's going to be a certain number that are going to go up. What is the ideal for a district like this? I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I can tell you that when I looked at out of districts and districts comparable sizes, we're like right, we're right in there. I mean, and they see the same thing, a little bit up and down. But we're, we're not exorbitant by any means. We're really right in there with a lot of the other districts. There's two, there's two charts in the beginning of the, um, the budget book that speak to that. You can see where our, and this is using the state metric on special education, so they're only interested in general fund special ed expenditures, and they don't include transportation in these numbers. So looking at the state comparison, you can see that we're about even with our fiscal comps, and while there's greater variation in our academic comps, we're, we're right in sort of the middle of the pack there. Those are in section one or two, I believe. Okay, um, two things. Gloria, could you open the back door now that the noise out there seems to have gone away? And so much uh, being cold, that's not so much anymore. Yeah. Well, we're an open meeting. We should have a door open. Uh, second thing is, I, uh, 
I assume we're taking advantage of uh, where appropriate, Dearborn, because since at least yes. it cuts out transportation costs. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Very, yes. Is there any other questions on the special ed issue? Peter. What's probably an easy on What's ABA? It's a, it's a certification on behavior. It's a behaviorist service. Okay, anybody else? John? Are you satisfied with the way that your reserve is, that 500K you were talking, talking about, that, that has to be more than 10 million? Are you satisfied with that method of having a reserve? As opposed to, for example, coming here to this meeting and saying to us, you know, we need something from the reserve fund. As much as I enjoy your company, I would prefer not to come back to you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we love to see you guys. <laughs> Don't push, John. They can't carry. We can't carry it over. Yeah. Here's one oh, yes. right. Okay. Is there any other, Joe? Well, uh, talking about the reserves, you know, it's very hard at town meeting to find that there is a huge reserve fund being held and not being spent when the town is incurring a tremendous financial burden. And when you tell people that you're holding this in reserve and they're going to blink their eye and say, if you don't spend it, you're going to lose it. And that's the whole problem with reserves fund. It's there, you're not spending it, but you have an expense that's going to occur anyway. So why not dip into the reserve fund? Because people are going to say, you know, it's there, let's use it and not keep in. You got three, three plus million uh, coming in this year. So, you know, let's use the reserve fund. That's what they're there for. When needed. One thing I think that people listening need to know is the reserve fund that we're talking about was money that was, was created by a surplus in the school department budget a couple of years ago. And so rather than <coughs> just to make sure that there was some money for a uh, situation like this, that's what it was established. And I would like to see to see money in there, but um, we do have to cover the cost this year. Okay, so let's move on from special education. And I'm sure if any questions pop up later or in the middle of the night, uh, <laughs> Diane, a call to Diane, she'd love to explain it to you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bode. So the, so the next phase is moving on here, page 12. Let's do an overview of what the next topics are that we're going to talk about with, re with respect to the FY15 budget. And I think it's important to understand what the overarching goals of the school department <coughs> are. The specifics of how we, we, we try to achieve these goals changes year to year in terms of district goals. But it's, it is important everybody understand that what we want is that every Arlington Public School graduate will be ready for college, career, and active citizenship. That the Arlington Public Schools will build staff capacity, fostering continuous improvement. We will provide a cost-effective education, supporting optimal teaching and learning. And in partnership with all town departments, the Arlington Public Schools will engage in effective collaboration and communication with all stakeholders. As we look at this, this next slide, um, this is actually a testament to the type of collaboration that has existed this past year um, with town officials, with the school committee, the finance committee, the, uh, as we looked at a problem that we were encountering. We've had steady growth since 2000 in the school district, but what has been mar remarkable is the growth that we've had in the last two years. I will say that that's not unique to Arlington. Why this 128 belt is seeing these kinds of increases? But we've had an increase of 281 students. When we, uh, we designed this plan for 3.5% growth on the operating budget, 7% on special education, the assumption was that we would be having, you know, there would be some growth, but it wasn't going to be precipitous as, it, as we've experienced. So we, we presented the problem to town, we worked together as a team to figure out what would be um, a way that we could address these needs. In the, last, um, in the last two years, we've had to add, at the elementary level, six new classrooms, and, and at the secondary level, lots of different sections to accommodate these. 
we've seen because because of this growth over it's not just even the last two years, it's been many years, we see an increasing pressure every year on class sizes. You know, at one point back uh, in 2000, which we would see class sizes down in 2022, you know, that's not the case anymore. We, particularly at the secondary level, we're seeing much larger class sizes. So what we worked out as a formula uh, for how we're going to go forward, uh, both for increases and potentially if we had any decreases, is that we would have a growth factor of 25% of the per pupil cost of the uh, previous year. So we'd always be working on, on actual numbers for the next budget year. And, and I do want to say again how grateful we are from the cooperation and, and working out a solution to this problem because it, it has been a significant problem um, going forward. So another issue we, we see in the FY15 budget which we'll try to address to, to some extent is that we have this growing demand on our administrators in the district and actually since um, 2010, we really haven't seen much of a growth in, in, in administrator uh, positions other than a year ago we had an increase of, a, of one assistant principal at the middle school as their enrollment increases and a half of, a, of an assistant principal at the, at the high school. So what we're finding is that uh, principals more and more need to be in classrooms for two reasons. One is to support and support teachers um, in, in the types of changes that need to occur in curriculum and, and pedagogy with respect to the implementation of Common Core State Standards, as well as the new teacher evaluation system, which requires many more visitations, many more meetings with teachers um, in a supervisory role. Um, so we're finding that our administrators are it's not hard to say that you know easily it has twofold increased in the amount of time that they actually are spending in the classroom, probably pushing close to 60% of the days. So this has been a growing demand for our, for our administrators. We've also had. Excuse me. <coughs> um, as I'm sure you know, this is hue, hue, and cry all across the country about the Common Core yeah. and whether or not it's a good idea and all, all sorts of protests. My guess is the process is going to slow down some until those kinds of things are resolved. A question I have for you is, might you slow up a bit on this particular <coughs> thing, given the uncertainty that's arisen across the country? Well, first of all... ease up, I feel like, on the administrators <laughs> in this country. Well, this, I have two, a couple of ways to look at that question. It's a great question. First of all, our assessments in MCAS and as we go into the park are going to test our students on the Common Core State Standards. This year, all of the MCAS will be focused on the new state standards. But I personally really support this trend in education. I think that it is uh, something that we really need to be moving forward on. Let me just take, for example, um, literacy. <coughs> It used, it used to be, even on the MCAS uh, years ago, that most of the questions that would be of reading questions tended to be much more of a literature based. But the reality in our very complex technological world, we need to educate um, our students to be able to read very complex. Did you don't want me to get into no, all no, this? No, it's not no. that. I, I know we should move on, okay? And, okay? and my question is holding itself a little bit. All I'm saying is, maybe think about easing up on how fast you might go in this direction. That's all I'm suggesting. Um, there's, there's no way to ease up because no. they're going to be tested on it and, yeah. and therefore we need to have to prepare them. It's our responsibility. Yeah. Okay. In fact, this year we're going to be um, piloting in a number of our schools and grades um, some of the park assessments. And in fact, this probably leads very nicely into the next part of this. I'd like to have me meet uh, Dr. Laura Chesson, who has been um, really leading a lot of our, uh, our technology changes over the last year, and certainly has been um, the person who's been helping with um, organize all of the park assessments. So we have uh, five schools that will be um, piloting the park 
this spring. We had no choice in which schools they would be, would be, what subjects they would do, what grades they would do, and whether they would take the test on paper or computer. Uh, it would have been nice, since Thompson is one of the schools that is taking the test, if they could have done it um, on computers, but they were selected at random to take it by paper. So we'll be doing it by computers at Dallin, and at, for one grade at Dallin, and, one, and three grades at Audison, and then we'll be doing it on paper at Bishop and at Thompson. Um, but talking about the park test um, and talking about the connection between the Common Core State Standards and technology, there are about 272 standards in the English Language Arts section of the Common Core State Standards, and 78 of those, almost one-third, specifically call for the use of technology, and about another, another 112 also infer the use of technology. Um, this test is meant to be totally uh, computerized, and that is so that the data can come back very quickly so that we have time to plan for interventions for students. Right now, the MCAS data really doesn't come back until late August, beginning of September, and at that point, we're getting ready to go into the, the fall. And we're, it's, while we do try to make interventions for students, it, if we had that data and park is set so that we would have that data probably two to three weeks after the uh, assessment's given, which would be in sometime in the early June time frame, we would be able to have all summer to plan on the interventions for those students. Um, so as you look at your slides, you'll see that um, we need sufficient um, testing equipment in order for the students to be tested. Uh, we have already tested our loads, and we will be able to test 2,000 of the students in the district at the same time based on the current um, web uh, access that we have. We'll actually be pulling the test down and putting it on a server here at the district so that we don't have to keep pulling up and down because if we did that, we'd only be able to test 200 kids at a time. So since we have to test every student grades 3 through 11 um, and, uh, and it all has to be computerized, we will be uh, using the fashion service. We also have to have our students uh, be very comfortable with technology. They need to be able to drag and drop. They need to be able to use scroll bars. They need to be able to use a split screen um, as early as third grade. So we've been doing practice with the principals and we'll be training teachers and then we'll be training students on how to use the technology. So they need to be very fluent in technology so they don't spend more time trying to figure out how to work the technology than answering the questions. Um, we've had seen a, a great um, explosion in teacher evaluation as Dr. Cody alluded to. Uh, I have uh, principals and curriculum coordinators who have 25 or 30 people to evaluate, and each one of those people has to be visited and have an observation written up and have to have a meeting with them four to six times a year. So literally, principals and curriculum directors have to do an observation at least one a day for the entire school year. And that means and each one of those uh, observations has a follow-up meeting. We're required by the state to collect evidence and to keep that evidence um, for some time. So to put that online is the best way to deal with it. Uh, the teachers also have a part of their teacher evaluation. 30% uh, of a teacher's evaluation is based on their impact to student achievement. So they need to be able to look at the data that's surrounding student achievement and analyze it and respond to it extraordinarily quickly. And so to that end, this year we have uh, purchased and are implementing um, a student data analysis system. Unfortunately, 280 teachers of the district can't access that currently because the machine that they have um, does not, is not quick enough or powerful enough to um, analyze that data. And since 30% of their evaluation is riding on this, we have to make upgrades to our teachers' machines. <coughs> If you go on to the next slide, when we talk about meeting the needs of all students, as you heard, the special education, yes, sir. Just, just a quick question. Yes, sir. It's not to you, it's actually to Mr. Foskett. Um, Charlie, <laughs> these, these computers that they're mentioning, these were the ones in the capital budget. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, $452,000. How much? Yeah, that's $452, right. $452,000. I'm just making sure what I was just referencing. Sorry, sure. we, no, no. our capital budget was presented. The town's capital, the townwide capital budget, was presented at a prior meeting. Um, Ms. Johnson was actually at the meeting. We talked about these computers at the meeting, so I was just trying to make sure in my own head that you weren't 
paying for these computers out of the school budget. Okay. Um, we talked about the increasing needs in special education and one of the ways for teachers to handle the diversification of students in their classroom is to use um, assistive technology, both visual and auditory. Um, many times uh, we do what's called a flip classroom when we make little videos for students so that students that need additional remediation can go back and watch the video of the teacher explaining over and over again. Uh, we also make those videos available to parents if they want to help with their students at home. We need to have, as we talked about before, monitoring student achievement is highly critical because so much of the teacher evaluation system is based on that. So we have a number of technology-based formative assessments, which means that assessment that informs instruction, not the summative assessment that comes at the end of the instruction. Um, and we need to provide ways for our students to demonstrate what they know and are able to do. Um, the last thing, as you would imagine, from adding all this technology is technology staffing. And just to sort of give you an idea, 18 months ago, we had two 50 meg pipes, and that's the amount of internet that comes into the school buildings. Today, we have two 225 meg pipes. Two years ago, we had 50 iPads in the district, and 18 months later, we now have 1,700, and that number is going to increase by 300 in the next upcoming school year. Um, we have 3,500 total devices across the district. We've put in 250 um, access points and 300 laptops over the last 18 months. As a result, we're uh, needing extra specialists. Uh, network management is critically important. When a teacher gets up in front of a class, the last thing that's going to really make that class go is if that technology is not working and if the internet goes down. Uh, even though we are using caching service for PARC, it does need to send them up and back, and if that data is um, not able to be transferred because the network is down, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Yes. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're going to get to this, but I, I thought I'd just throw out the question. Um, why are we still <coughs> buying books? Uh, is, the, is the system looking at some point to getting all the books um, automatically, uh, uh, electronically? Um, actually, this year, past year, we adopted new textbooks for grades six and seven mathematics, and we only purchase classroom sets and then purchase digital copies for the students to use at home. Um, textbook manufacturers are not um, un aware of what's going on. And so, right now, the cost of a digital textbook is cheaper than a regular textbook, but it's not as cheap as one might think. Um, however, we are also looking at multiple open source textbooks. There are many consortiums. One is actually sponsored by Burlington Public Schools, where teachers are actually coming together and they're using the technology that we have available to work together to put the resources in, in digitally. And I would say, yes, over time, there will be less and less um, reliance on textbooks. We're already seeing that. I mean, that'll be great. I'm also worried about the shoulders, neck, and back of our students carrying these things around. I, I, I mean, just for myself, I mean, I know that everything that I have is on my iPad, the journals, the books, the everything that, you know, all the documents that I need to read are on there. So, yes, we are very much working with students um, to try to uh, alleviate some of that stress. Um, it will be, it will be, some time before we totally get rid of books. Uh, Stephen, just a question on the iPad. You, you said the 1,700 iPads yes. in the district, and that's that's for student use. Primarily, I mean, each lot, many many staff members have them as well, so that they can use them to create curriculum and, mm -hmm. and show them in the classroom. But the vast majority of those are for students. And, yes. and, and, and if you know, what, what percentage of, of the students have access to to iPads presently, and what would be the goal of the next? Five years. Okay. It varies from building to building. Certainly, Thompson is one to one. Mm -hmm. So uh, those students have iPads all day long. Um, that's not to say that they use an iPad all day long, but they have access to those iPads all day long. Um, at the other elementary schools, they have anywhere from three carts for the entire elementary school to a, a cart per grade, which is what we're looking for. for that's one of the capital reasons for next year is to get equity among the elementary schools. Thompson aside. Mm -hmm. Um, at the middle school, we have one cluster that, that has iPads, that, um, it's a pilot cluster to see what that would work out as a middle school. Um, and so it really varies. I would say probably more access at the elementary and the middle schools um, and less access at the high school. 
becomes much more expensive at the high school and currently Dr. Janger has a, a group of uh, teachers that are going around looking at different communities to look at what their are. <coughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and that's the end of the... Yes. John? I asked this question at the, at the night that uh, we had the Bible training community. I'm going to ask you as well. Do you have any idea about the security of the sensitive data that's going to go back and forth uh, through this very elaborate... Uh, For the testing? Yes. Testing data? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a very, we test our network all the time for um, whether it's secure or not, whether it can be hacked, um, and we'll be, we'll be continuing to do that as we go back and forth. Um, the DOE sends a lot of, uh, uh, almost every piece of data that we get now comes from uh, student data, it's very sensitive data, goes up and down, and we'll be sending it through that pipeline. So I would, I would feel that that data, no, I can't say forever because two kids in a garage can figure out how to do anything if they get enough uh, motivation, um, as Mr. Gates has proved. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's as secure as it can be. Yeah. And we certainly, are, that's something that we watch all the time. Thank you. Sorry? Dr. Chesson, can you just uh, make a comment on the, uh, at one time at one of the Capital Planning Committee meetings, you mentioned that with this new, uh, with these computers and with the, I don't know if it was a park or, or Common Core or whatever, but he, almost all the students will have an individual education plan or not, not, not exactly the same as in the SPED, but they'll be much more uh, yes, close, we can increase, closely tracked. Let's we can increase the amount of um, personalization, but also we're, the amount of data that we're collecting on student achievement um, is far in, in advance of what we did before in the sense that it's all in the same place. So a teacher can actually sit down and say, show me all the students um, that didn't do well on this math exam, show me their reading levels, how many of these students are special education students, how many of these students are ELL students, so that they can really design interventions that can be tailored for the individual student. One of the things that teachers are doing along those lines also is, and it's growing, it's not totally universal, but you have a particular grade, a particular school, it's elementary, you can take the students uh, after a math exam and make flexible groups. So there's three teachers, they might divide up, or maybe they might even divide with four or five teachers based on the data that they have, that they, they check in baseline edge, just to, so that the students that really need an you know, extra challenge will get that, and the students that need some repetition at certain levels can get that as well. So I think that we're going to be seeing not only the effects of the data and the access to the data um, in terms of these plans, but also just the way we teach. And that is changing already. And, I, and uh, more and more of the work that the teachers do together in the planning is all about looking at data <coughs> analysis. I might also add that I want to thank the Capital Committee for giving us this money because it really is going to make a big difference next year. So thank you. Right, more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we talked a little bit about this, but we do, when we're looking at next year's budget, we want to look at what we're looking at. Um, there are some areas, in general, they fall under just education of all students, and they fall in the category of special types of um, support in the form of math or reading interventions, um, behavioral support. We have more children at younger ages who are needing more support in terms of being able to, to regulate themselves to be in school. Um, related services with special education, we're constantly looking at the staffing of our programs. It, it can vary uh, depending <coughs> on the number of students in the program. And of course, the uh, big thing is we're going to, we've adjusted the FY15 to account for this increase in special education. But in addition to that, we're going to have um, Money is available for additional teaching staff at the high school. How that will work out, whether it's a you know, how, how much, how many more FTEs in science or math or world language, even if we have a projection right now, it will be it will be um, finalized once we actually have the students pick the courses for next year. In fact, I met with curriculum leaders today to talk about this very topic. So that part is all moving forward. 
But we do know that in mathematics at the high school, we're going to at least add one more FTE because more and more students um, really have to take fourth year math. And we, in past years, have had maybe only 80% to 85% taking a fourth year math, and that, that needs to change. So that, that will be one of the FTEs we have there. At the middle school, the larger enro en enrollments that we're seeing are hitting the middle school, and some of the, some of the funds for this budget will go toward creating another cluster. The, the school has not decided yet whether that will be a split cluster cluster between grades or whether it will be all six grades. But then in addition to this, we'll have five reserve positions for the, for the entire district. One of the things that was uh, something that was a little risky last year and it turned out we, are, we did, did not work out as well as we thought, we put in two reserve positions and we end up having to put in five elementary classrooms in this, over the course of summer. We didn't even know we needed the five. We knew we might need one back in May, but that all evolved as we went into the summer. So this way we know that we'll, the, the money will be there for those, for those positions. Are they on the five reserve teaching? Are they there instead of having substitutes? Or are they no. there just in case of enrollment? They're, no enrollment. they're in the case of enrollment. Um, let me just give you a, a information I just have since Friday. We, on the last couple of weeks doing kindergarten enrollment. We have enrolled in these two weeks 436 students. Our projection for next year is 442. We already have nine people coming in this week for registration. So we, this is March. We are going to be well past that 436 by the time we get to September. So, I mean, I already, you know, it's, it's very likely that we're already seeing with some of these reserve positions are going to go because as these larger classes move up through the schools the teachers will, the number of teachers will stay the same in a certain grade but then we still have then you know classrooms uh, that are going to be increased now where we will end up in September with these numbers I don't know um, but it's we were not at the same we were not at that number last year this time Stephen yeah <coughs> just a question that you make because Let's stick to the Audison for a second. If, if there is a new cluster and, and the amounts that are allocated here is just for staff, are there additional costs to, to find rooms or to, are we getting to a point, especially up at the Audison, that there's going to be additional costs just beyond labor to either reconfigure areas or even have the temporary classrooms up there? Because I, I honestly don't know where you'd fit another cluster right now. And, is it, is it special rooms that need to be reconfigured for <coughs> regular classroom use? And if, if that's the case, how does that get funded? Well, fortunately next year, the answer will be no. We're gonna take one program that's at the middle school, it's a special ed program, and move it to the, to the high school. Um, but um, do we identify by moving some other programs around to have the four classrooms? As we go forward beyond that, um, we're going to be needing to look at probably some division of rooms um, and reconfigurations. Yes, but for next year, no, we'll be fine. Okay. So, uh, I mean, just beyond the audits, though, right? So, and I won't forget the number, but you had an increase in enrollment this year that we're in right now. Um, I think you had an increase above expectation over that. You talked about the trend growing. Right? You have the 436 kindergartners, of which one is mine. <coughs> Another one is my brother's. Um, so it's your fault. It's my fault. <laughs> yes. Um, so what is your? What about the overall space needs of the of, of the district? I mean, we talk about the Audison, but now you get to the elementary schools. We get middle school, the high school. I mean, we're going to start running into issues at some point. Short answer is yes. Uh, yes, uh, I think at the elementary we will be um, fine for a, a number of years. Though I will say we have two schools where, you know, continuing to get four classes at a particular grade level is, is going to be very difficult. When I looked at the 436, we do have roughly a fourth of those students in buffer zones. So I'm 
to the extent possible, try to be able to even classrooms out over the next uh, over the next couple months. The issue is real. Well, the elementary should be fine, though. Having said that, you know, it's sustained year after year of this over the next decade could put some pressures on. We did not see this this increase because if you look at the number of children that are born here and you project them out, you didn't see all of the move-ins. And there's no way to see that. There really isn't. But at any rate, going to the middle school, that is certainly going to be an area of, of concern as we move forward. And yes, maybe in a, two years out we'll be able to do some reconstruction. It would be, it would be, there are different ways that you can look at this issue. One is we could do short term, it may need to have some portables at, at the middle school. It, you know, down the road we may need, if this trend continues, to have addition there. It could also be that when we're looking at um, the high school, we think about that a little bit differently too, in terms of the possibility of having um, uh, the eighth grade class there in a, a certain part of the building. The, the, and then I was going to actually get to that. So we are going to have to think about that very carefully because, uh, as, you, as you know, the Board of Selectmen and the School Committee have both endorsed submitting a statement of interest to the MSBA at um, the end of this month. The MSBA is going to see all of our enrollments and they're going to ask us what is going to be the solutions. That, that would be some of the conversations should we be accepted into the next stage of this. But yes, it is a concern. Now, we've seen two years of this growth. Will we see the same thing next year? I don't know, but I do know that as I see these elementary class, class sizes coming in, which are in the, you know, the mid-400s, our retention rate between grades, and you have that in your chart, um, the, I think they have the, the chart in a moment, um, you will see that the, the number is very high. In fact, and some of them is over one to indicate that there has been an increase um, beyond 100% into grades, and those are all the students that move in. So yes, the, as we see these grades come through, can Audison handle um, a school of 1,300? Squeezed. We probably can. Um, but can, you know, 13, 13, 50, if we're seeing 450s in there. But beyond that, we're going to be needing to look at something different as an alternative. Hey, Jared. In discussing the audits, and we had a presentation last week by the uh, superintendent of Minuteman, mm -hmm. and he was uh, his interview was they interview people who want to come to Minuteman, and some of the respondents said they want to come to Minuteman because this, their student is enrolled in the audits, and it's too crowded, so they're going to have their student go to the Minuteman, and I almost fell off my chair because here's a student that wants to go to school in Arlington, <laughs> and because of the crowding in the audits. His parents have decided that's not a good place for him to be. So I, I was just, I was flabbergasted when I heard that. And that's well, now. That's not <coughs> when we get There's to been a the substantial team. pickup at Minuteman yeah. this you know, for this last year. So it'll be interesting to well, see if that continues. Mm -hmm. Charlie? So um, this uh, pressure on the capacity leads, leads me to uh, uh, one of my favorite subjects, which is getting the METCO program to pay for their students. And uh, there's also, as I understand it, uh, there's a program now uh, where some teachers can bring their children into the district without the sending district paying the full cost of educating the students. And I've also learned from um, uh, Mrs. Johnson that uh, the, the um, let me call them, some of the private uh, special, uh, special environments in town that take care of uh, kids with special needs also wind up getting uh, uh, being educated in the system, and and in some cases neither the state nor the uh, sending towns are paying for those students. And, and I'm wondering what steps the uh, school committee and the uh, school administration are taking to address this funding shortfall, in other words, where, the, where we're absorbing the cost of this education uh, for basically out-of-district uh, users. Well, let's take each one individually, because they are, they are different. With respect to the medical program, we've had this discussion at this table in past years as well. The decision of 
Arlington to have the medical program was not a decision made on the finances of it back close to 40 years ago. It was based on issues of social justice, um, uh, values of wanting to have a more uh, diverse student population, to be, have our students be able to, to look outside their own world. And I think that um, that, it, that historically has been a very successful program. In terms of the actual number of students that we've had in the medical program in the years that, since I've been in this role, they've actually come down. And the reason why, is we, in, in, with Medco, we look at space available. And I look very carefully at different the schools that have the Medco program at, at them and what the, what the but if a particular folder or application comes in, I look at the grade to see if that if that meets um, the num a number with some 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 possibility that number could go up, which we've seen happens. So there have been we've gone from about 100 to 71 over the last few years, just because there hasn't been the available classroom space. I think that the issue, um, I, you know, I, we've certainly discussed this over the years. Um, you know, I've read your article. There is certainly an argument to be made about the, the role of the state funding Medco better. And there's been lobbying efforts to do that. So I think the issue isn't, yeah, I think it's a town of Arlington. It was a decision by the town of Arlington to have this program here. I think that it has been a successful program. I think it's continuing to be successful. And, you know, whether it's evaluated on it, on its um, the fiscal pieces of it, um, that is something that a greater group of people are going to have to look at more carefully. Does anything you want to add on that, Coach? Okay. So uh, I, I, I would like to suggest it's very difficult for a greater group of people to evaluate this question if it's not led by the school committee. It's a school department issue. The school's asking for an additional $885,000 this year to accommodate growth. And we have, uh, in the, between those two classes, students, the METCO and, and the, and the um, teacher program, uh, 76, I think, students that are essentially paying only $2,000 through Chapter 70 out of a $12,000 um, per student educational expense. And, and to me, it's, it's not, I mean, I'm not making any comment about the social or academic or other values about METCO. My problem with METCO is that we're subsidizing the city of Boston. They have an educational cost per student of $17,000 a year. So they're sending students here for $2,000 a year. We're eating 10000 of our own expenses, and they're saving, even if they paid the full boat, they'd be saving $5,000 a year. So that's a subject that has to be led by the by the school department and the school committee, and and it's it's not a question of social values or or any of the vast subjective issues that have been 50 years ago associated with the medical program. It's a question of what Arlington can afford now. That eight that 750 thousand dollars a year would go a long way to f filling up your um, special education gap. You know the, the variability for your for your. Um, um, Reserve funds, or it would it, it would more than pay for the for the uh, Thompson School. So it's not it's not chump change. It's a big number, and the school committee and the school administration has to take the leadership role to get this problem solved. It's not it can't come from the finance committee or the capital planning committee or some other group. It's your responsibility. It's your bag. The, um, during the, <coughs> up until it was really these last years where we've had this increase. The situation with the number of students we've had for the medical program is that if we were to have the entire program leave the district, would there be any substantial changes in the number of classroom teachers we would have or um, any of our fixed costs? We have about 35 students at the elementary among actually six schools now. Um, but primarily four, for the, and that puts maybe one or two students per grade. So if you take those students out, that's not the issue, Doctor. Yeah, no. The issue is twelve thousand dollars a year educated students. Right. 
this is a, a you know, city down the road has, uh, I don't know, there's $990 million of assessed value. We have a billion dollars of assessed value, but 99 billion. We have, we have seven billion. They have tremendous industrial and tax base. They're closing schools because they have extra capacity. And we're, they should be paying us to educate those children. It's just simple. And, and somehow this problem has to get solved because it's, it's eating, it, you know, you're, you're looking at all of this, this increase in, in, in stress on the school system, and that's an avenue where the stress could be relieved. I'm not saying that the students shouldn't come here. I'm saying the city of Boston should pay for it. Well, how is that going to happen? The, I'm asking the, you to solve that problem. I'm asking the school committee to solve that problem because it's your school district that you're running. It's the only, there is no way that, we have lobbied for increase, in, increased funding from the state. There have been lobbying days, there have been letters, there's been discussions. One, what has to happen if that is the case, is there really does, it's a political issue because the funding comes from the state. The only way that, is, is Arlington going to be able to force Boston And maybe the finance committee could could do that. What would be, what I think you're asking us to do, if I'm interpreting this correctly, <coughs> is to eliminate the medical program. No, so I never said it. No. I never said it. Okay. No, okay. Right. I simply not, said no, Boston is not paying its fair share, right. and we're subsidizing the city of Boston, and right. we're crazy to do that. Right. Absolutely crazy. And how are we going to get the, the city of Boston? I don't know, you've got the staff there, you've got, you've got a $56 million budget, figure it out. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, hopefully, it's your job to do the job. Okay, to go and get hopefully for the state. And uh, maybe the school committee uh, could look into taking some action, maybe with the legislators, but, uh, you know, all, we're, we're getting crowded. And, Looking at crowding at the Audison and, and even the high school, you know, it's an issue that we need to look at. But as, as I've said also in the numbers, that I've, I, I look very carefully. So if we don't have capacity at a particular grade, particular school, we don't accept students at that grade or that school. So there's really a, a, a really a fine level of the, um, thinking that goes into this. <coughs> and it may be that our numbers will continue to drop as we have less available space. Um, but I think that we have a responsibility, and that's actually was part of the medical agreement that the students that we currently have um, are considered Arlington students. That's that's how the original program was set up. To your second point, uh, the issue of um, the number of uh, students that come here through a negotiated contract. There was a pilot this year, and it is it is a pilot in which we have five students. Uh, you're correct, so that puts the number at, at, at 76. We have five students that um, were, are, are students of teachers in the district. This is not an uncommon practice in other districts. It was um, argued to be an issue of retention of really good teachers. But many, but we only have that number of students. Um, with respect to the um, out of district students that come through our group homes, if that's, that's the ones you're referring to primarily. That's a, that's a very tough one because we have group homes and we have right now, I believe, 10 group homes that at different points have had students come through the Arlington programs. And there are different types of bedroom designations. So in, in a particular program, you could be residential in that program <coughs> and they are the only real Support the Allen Public Schools gives is, is help um, monitor, not monitor, but um, manage your Title I money. But then there are students that are in a, in a group home bed who, by the way the law is designed right now, the LEA, the, the public school in which the group home exists, assumes the educational cost of educating that student. Now, we have a number of students. There's a lot of churn in that, the number of students that we have, but we do have um, a significant number. It's primarily at the high school, but the middle school also. But the, the, the most, um, the greatest number by a margin of like 
three to one is more at the, at the high school level. And uh, we have been doing a good job. Here's, here's again the, the, the dilemma you get into. We want to do a good job. We want, we want these students to be successful. It's our responsibility to help them be successful. But in doing that, we also have caught the eye of DCF and other groups saying that they're doing a good job. And so um, there is more of a sense of trying to place students in this area. So it's a, it's a dilemma. But that's the way the law is structured. And that's something that the Arlington Public Schools can do to change. That is legislative action, if that is going to change at all. We do want to do some more analysis on this. This is a really complicated area, and we need more time to look at. Um, <coughs> I mean, one of the things that's really disadvantageous is that unless the students are in Arlington, in our schools on October 1, we receive no Chapter 70 for them. If they come on October 2nd, too bad. And because chapter, you know, the, the educational funding was predicated on the idea that the student comes and stays all year, because that's the way it used to be. And these students that are so highly fluid, they challenge all of our administrative systems, they challenge everything. Now the tuition and money that you see in our funding source came from the fact that we would rebuild for, for these group home students who are on IEPs, who received special education services. The law does allow us to bill for the special ed portion, not their general ed portion, that we're responsible for, but we can build our home district for special ed costs. However, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education decided that the methodology that we use to rebuild our districts needed to follow a different prototype, which greatly truncates our ability to rebuild for special education services. What further challenges our ability to rebuild for special education services is that very often these students arrive without an IEP. So they have to go through testing, they have to get on an IEP, the IEP has to be written, and that, that can be a factor of weeks. And then if they're gone in three months, you might have done all this work only to bill for a week before they're gone somewhere else. It's enormously frustrating, and we need to give it more attention. I think this is an area where the state really needs to, I think the state needs to do more for us here. I mean, we're not even getting Chapter 70 on the majority of these kids because they're not here on October 1. Yeah. Okay, why don't we move along, John? Just one more question. Uh, we are not the only school system with a Metro program. No. no. Right? Are all the, all the districts in the same situation we are relative to cost? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. How come it's not possible, and I'm really asking the school committee rather than you guys, because I, don't, I personally don't think it's your problem. I think it's the school committee's problem. How come it is that we don't have an aggregate effort on the part of ourselves and other Metco programs to go and lobby strongly with our, with our, or do we? Metco does organize lobbying efforts. Yes, they do. They just had one quite recently. Um, the it's how receptive the state legislature later is our with respect to this request. They're looking at all the different things that they want to fund. Do all our reps and senator are they fighting for this? Have they attended this? Um, one, of the, one of the strongest voices on this is Jay Kaufman, who you know, no longer has. But um, he has been a very strong voice on, on trying to get additional medical funding. But when they go into their decisions about what they're going to fund, other things get funded, or they keep it at a level funding, and which basically we've been at for um, a while. And, the and what we receive in terms of medical grant pays for the transportation, which is about 133000 a year. And then um, additional costs for administration for um, the people who administer the program, in <coughs> as well as other professional development and, 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 and services for the students as well. So relatively speaking, the um, as all the other costs go up and that stays flat, you, you have a diversion step there as well. Okay, uh, Paul? Yeah. I just want to address the issue of students moving from one district to another, be it through MECO, school choice, charter schools. There are tremendous inequities in the funding as students are moving. If we send a kid to a charter school, we've got a, what, $12,000, $13,000 um, uh, garnishment on our local aid account. If we accept a kid under school choice, it's $5,000. It, you know, none of this works out. So that there's a tremendous need for the state to address 
all the different ways the kids move district to district. Whether a kid is leaving Boston going to a charter school or coming out to a MECO program. Now we have a political problem in that the number of districts who are receiving MECO districts are limited to suburban districts around Boston and some around Springfield. Uh, it is not a politically potent region in that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, say the Boston delegation who would not want to pay Arlington at a charter rate to send a kid out on the MECO program. Uh, there's also a lot of resistance to look at reforming the way we pay for charter schools. So it's a vexing political problem. I think that we as a school committee can advance to MASC this year a resolution calling for a, a, a look at uh, all funding for students crossing town lines or leaving school districts uh, and finding a more equitable way to pay for it. It's been a very consistent lobbying effort of MASC since I was president of the organization for that. But there is a lot of reason for legislative inertia on changing any of the funding schemes. Because if we're advantaged, somebody else is disadvantaged. It's like changing the underlying Chapter 70 formula. So there's not going to be a great aha in, on Beacon Hill to right this wrong because it's going to go and move money from one set of communities to another. So it, it, it's a vexing problem. And there's no easy answer, and we have to continue to advocate for that on a reliable basis. And that's all, that's all we can say. Thank you. Okay, shall we uh, see if we can? Okay. Fine. Well, the, the next graph is one that you've, you've seen in the past, the some page 20, uh, which, which looks at the budget by major categories. And uh, I think that the, the, the one that, there's a lot of interesting information here, but the one I do want to call your attention to is the one that's um, on the right-hand side of the graph, interventions, that we have been doing investments in that category. Uh, that, that portion of the pie has increased, but that is also one of the reasons why our referrals have remained, have gone down and, and remained rather static in the last couple of years. So going on, there's sort of a summary of where we are with what the cost will be next year. We have, as per our, our agreement for the long-range planning, is we have a 3.5% growth in, in the general education budget, seven in special ed. We continue to get the kindergarten uh, key officers, <coughs> which has been a great success story. Not only do we have a full-time kindergarten, but the town receives anywhere from four to 600,000 additional revenue to, um, to the fund. And then, of course, the enrollment factor this year, which would, which would give the operating budget uh, an additional 885000 So you can see the key, the key drivers in all, of, in all of this, and that is summarized in the chart, the, the circle graph following this, which shows that the, the I, I particularly like this graph in ones we've done in the past, because while we have town appropriation, I think it's good to see how town appropriation itself is divided up in terms of the estimated Chapter 70 amount and then the uh, town appropriation for other resources. So basically we're looking at a very rough 20% of the revenue that comes through the town comes through Chapter 70 money. And, you know, grants remain an important part of the budget as well as do the revolving accounts and reimbursements. So, looking ahead, what are we looking at in terms of Can I just ask one question on the, uh, looking at the revenues? Uh, and since the revenues are such an important part of your uh, uh, total package, for fiscal 14, this fiscal year, um, are the revenues coming in as projected? In other words, do you anticipate any significant shortfall in revenues coming in that you can't make up for? Um, I do I do anticipate that the tuition and money will be short of expectation. Um, just how short is not clear just yet. Um, but we expect to perform strongly in foreign visas. Um, we'll see that money, uh, another piece of that money come rolling in about May. And we seem to be right on with athletic fees 
and kindergarten fees, music fees, I'm sorry, not kindergarten fees, monogamy um, fees, music fees, um, doing, doing well in academic ticket sales. So I think overall we'll be fine. Um, I have factored in, um, even, though I, even though I know we may be a, a, a bit short in the tuition in, we have balances that we can use from prior years that will make up the 500000 that I have to. Okay. So you already have five thousand in the bank. Okay. So you anticipate that you will have you will have a balanced budget um, at year end. Yes. Correct. For this year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. With that five hundred thousand in the stable state. Uh, so as we look going to the future, and we've talked a little bit, quite a bit about this, um, there are, there remain pressures that we're going to be dealing with going forward. Um, the role of technology, the pressures in terms of um, common core, more professional development for teachers, the enrollment growth, and also not not a small part is the increasing student mental health and behavior concerns that we have seen, and in this case, one of the things that our contracted service budget um, is, is gone over for, is for one of those reasons. In fact, this last year we have we hired last year we hired for this year two behavior specialists and the elementary principals of all in unison have asked for another behavior specialist for next year um, because of what we're, we're seeing in the area. <coughs> moving on to the last um, Grant, oh, excuse me, yes. Dr. Rohde. Grant, do you have a question? I have a question on the increase in student mental health. Is that across the board for all students or is it just the... Uh, it is across the board. We're seeing that it, it's across the board. 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 It's even much younger age. And one, of course, one of the things we like to find out... Not special ed across the board. Yes, not special ed. Yes, not special ed. Um, young, in younger age, ages that we've seen. And, and talking with other superintendents and our director of special ed, talking as well as among assistant superintendents. This is not just Arlington. This is everywhere. Everyone is seeing the same kind of trends that we're seeing. And you know, there's a lot of speculation why. And I, I can't give you any reasons why. It's just that we're seeing it and we're responding <coughs> as effectively as we can. Is one of the responses that perhaps will lead to an evaluation where you can lead to a special education program? Yeah. Well, that, that's a possibility. Um, that's one of the reasons why, in having a behaviorist on staff, one of the things they do is they work with the teacher and the principal and all the other support people in the, in the in a building in the classroom to create um, behavior plans so that the student can be able to learn in the classroom. Because what happens is if you can't learn and you get so far behind, what that does is create a, a number of, of, of problems. Sure. Now, they may not call for special ed, but they would, call, they would potentially have a lot of learning. Well, when does the behavior, special ed behavior kind of cross into an individual education plan? Um, it can. It can be in an individual education plan. Yes, absolutely. Right. It both. How much is it? Um, how much is it? I don't, I don't know how to quantify that. Uh, you know, two years ago, we didn't even have a behavior on, on staff. It really has been something that has been noticeable in the last few years. And um, teachers will talk about principles. It's, 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 I'm not quite sure how to quantify it, other than in terms of you know, the behavior plans that you might have put in place earlier. Okay. John? The AYCC has turned itself around rather significantly in terms of finances. And I'm just wondering if you're taking enough advantage, if I may just pose the question, do you think you're taking enough advantage of the AYCC and your relationship with them? Yes, we'd love to do even more. We have a, six, a counseling grant for the elementary, and part of that actually money we put toward AYCC, and they, they work with us very closely at all levels. Um, and a model that works quite well is that when, when we have a student that perhaps can benefit from counseling services, that that may start in a connection in the schools, but then move over into uh, independent type of counseling that can go through third-party payments. 
I think one of the most important things that AYCC did a couple of years ago was to um, be able to do third party payments out of, insure, out of health insurance policies. So as we uh, just close up here, uh, it's just talking about the high school. As we're, as I mentioned earlier, we um, we <coughs> we're, we're planning to submit a statement of interest to MSBA to look at what we need to do for the high school. Um, we've done a, we've done over the last year a number of studies to just to try to help us identify what those needs are. Uh, with outside experts, one of which was the on-site inside group that came in and did a mechanical and, and infrastructure evaluation. That reports online. We've had, um, of course, the enrollment, which is what MSBA also likes to, to know about. And then the, also the programmatic analysis by uh, the architectural firm of HMSA to look at what are the issues in the, in the current high school. That report has also been a, given to you as well. Uh, we um, have been trying to educate people about this more. In fact, we had a tour this last Saturday. We had about close to 100 people come. We're going to have a tour tomorrow and Thursday, both from 4 to 5.30. I don't think as many people have signed up at that time. But um, given the feedback we've had, that we'll probably do uh, at least another tour on a Saturday in, in the next month or so. But I think it's, it's helpful for people to be educated about this um, in terms of the timeline, once we get this report, and I think that we'll probably know by early summer whether we are invited to the next stage or not. So that concludes the, my uh, main points that I wanted to give you as a sort of an overview of where we're going, where we have been, where we're going next year, next year's budget. Any other questions? Okay. Ken? Not maybe directly <coughs> to the budget, but what's <coughs> on the plans on some of the um, schools? For the uh, Stratton School, the uh, school committee to make a promise to the town about that they would renovate all seven schools. But obviously, nothing has been said about the Stratton because that's a bulldog of money. Well, I'm glad you brought it up because actually, a lot's been going on in Stratton. We have a building committee and we have representation on it, not unlike we do for MSBA, we have a member from the capital committee. And we've done the charge from the capital committee has been to. Um, decide to look at what is going to be needed at Stratton in order to have parity with the other elementary schools and I think we're getting very close to what that will look like. In addition to that, we also need to do some infrastructure um, work at Stratton. Um, we did, in the last phase in the project, we did you know, the, the usual windows, boilers, heating, and then we had to do the same thing for the other part of the building. So that's what we're for. We are moving also forward and getting an architect to help us with um, um, take some of these ideas and be able to cost them out as to what we'd be looking at in order for that to happen. That will go to capital in the <coughs> cycle next year, and then it will be up to capital to help us figure out how we're going to pay for this um, as going forward. But the goal is to have Stratton be on par with all the other elementary schools. One of the things that was very interesting, um, we have a couple engineers on the building committee, one of which is a member of the capital committee, and they did a analysis of all the buildings in terms of, of size of spaces. And what we found is what we sort of expected, is that in terms of some common areas, such as the media, the library, the kitchen area, and the medical service area, they're much smaller than the other schools. But the classrooms are much larger, in fact, substantially larger. The kindergartens are almost twice as big as the other schools. So we're working with that in terms of how to get parity and what it's going to cost. And as I said, our goal is to get it to capital in August or early September. So maybe is it a safe statement to say that the Stratton, in some way, shape, or manner, will be improved, but will definitely not be renovated as the, to the extent of the other schools? Well, that is, is that a fair renovated. statement? It'll be renovated. It has already had some renovation. The thing is, what the, when MSBA started uh, in this latest iter iteration of itself, they went through the whole Commonwealth and rated all the schools as to whether they would be eligible to come into a renovation program. And Stratton never was. Stratton, Stratton would, if we submitted an SOI on Stratton, it's not going anywhere because it's not on the 
work by their designation. On the other hand, we were able to go to, M to MSBA on major repairs. And that actually was able to give us more money to do a little bit more in the last phases that we did. Thank you very much. Okay, Dean. Three questions, I'll try to look quick. Um, sort of a general governance question, short term, medium term, long term. What keeps you up at night? What bothers you? Short term, medium term, and long term. What keeps, what keeps you up at night? Yep. Well, recently it's been our special education increases in terms of what we need to do because snow. Snow always keeps me up. Yes. Yes. Those are very, those are those are short nights. Um, and I and I spend a lot of time thinking about space issues, particularly moving with the high school. You know, I think that we have a lot of issues going with facilities, um, certain Stratton, pressures at Addison, um, the high school, and how does that all fit into the long-range plan of the town in terms of balancing, trying to keep the operating budgets and, and balance, and as well be able to do all these fiscal projects. And of course, you're also, we're also looking at Minuteman. So there's a lot of things that are going on right now in terms of how do you how do you figure out how to move in which direction and what, and what pace? So, I, before I ask my second question, what I find to be, wait, why I was, the reason I was smiling as you were responding is, when the town manager comes before us, um, I ask him the exact same question every time he's before us. So in our opening finance committee meeting, I asked him the question and he gave the exact same response you gave. <laughs> so it was, talk a lot. well it was interesting, which leads to my second question though, it's a nice little segue. Is um and just to preface it, this goes back five or six years ago. I, I was very, uh, I'll use polite words. I was very angry when I, what I felt was the unfair treatment that you or you or as, the, as being representing the superintendent of the school were getting at sort of at, at, through our finance committee process and through interactions with the town. Because I used to hear this term, this verbiage would be used. We talk about the town and the school, like the school was this separate weird thing off on its own and it wasn't a problem for the town, but I don't know whose town the school belonged to, right? Um, it appears to have gotten better, right? It appears when you look at the additional money that went into the budget, if you listen to the town manager talking about can't really caring deeply about Arlington High School and Minuteman and things like that, it feels like it's gotten better, but it, it doesn't mean anything if I feel like it's gotten better, it matters if you can't think it's gotten better. So in terms of your I'm going to say treatment. How you feel you're part of part of? Do you feel you're part of the team? Do you feel you're isolated? Do you? How's it going? I do not feel isolated at all. I feel very much part of the team, and and I think the town manager, as well as the preceding town manager, it does a lot to bring departments together. Um, I feel that I have a very good collaborative working relationship with the town manager, and certainly with all the department heads as well. I think that. <coughs> I think with even when we have discussions in the, in the school department, certainly at the school committee, but we're thinking about all of these pieces. It's not we're not a, we're not a school system over here that's separate and apart from the town. It's all one community, and it's so essentially it's all the same money. It's just how it gets divvied up in terms of what we want to achieve. And we have a lot of things we have to achieve, and we have to you know, certainly choose priorities. In fact, with the enrollment growth factor that we have, one of the strong feelings on this was that we did not want, we wanted to make sure this was going to work in terms of the long range plan. Um, because stable budgets, predictable budgets are very are good on the part of the schools. It just is a simple fiscal piece. So when you don't have that, that that's, that's not a good place to be. So we all talk about this quite a bit. and try to plan together and um, I don't think that that I know I don't and I'm and maybe I'm speaking for Adam but I, I think that he would feel the same. We, we really do have a lot of communication about common issues and common goals. Well I asked him the same question actually okay. because I care deeply about who you are, you know, fit into the thing the, the greater town scheme and he actually said the same thing. Um, so my last thing it gets not a question it's more of a comment. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I know you have a, you guys have some long days. You have some meetings. You have lots of meetings. Um, meetings with the school committee. You come here, and then I actually my wife went to a event a few weeks back about a kindergarten curriculum or something where you you the Thompson principal and some other people were standing in there. And I have to say, my wife did comment that um, 
she was amazed at how you sort of stood in there and you know you actually you know sometimes you have two home superintendents that are isolated and you were not you sort of come out there so thank you for coming and thank you for with those kind words are there any other are there any other questions? <laughs> sure. So uh, I appreciate the collaborative effort that went into the growth factor, but the way it came out at the end of that impact plan, I'm wondering if over the long term, is that really enough to cover all of the costs of the additional students that are coming in? Do you really feel that's going to be enough to cover all the costs? Well, we're going to work to make it. We're going to work very hard to make it work. Um, but I, I, do, I don't look at this in isolation of much bigger plan. And I truly mean this. A stable, predictable budget going on all three years is in the interest of the school department, too. Okay, is there any other questions for the uh, superintendent? Uh, Dr. Bowie, Ms. Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, school committee for attending. We appreciate your input. Okay. Uh, just to finish this uh, up, we have, not going to get through as much as I told you in the email, uh, we've got two issues before us. One is Article 7 of the Special Town Meeting uh, requesting a transfer of $500,000 from the Stabilization Fund. Now, this is the Educational Stabilization Fund for Special Ed. It was established by a transfer from the uh, school department, I think either last year or the year before. Uh, they're requesting their 500000 back into the fiscal 14 budget uh, to help take into account special ed. Uh, do I have a motion on that? So oh. second. 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 Any discussion? Any questions? Paul. I have my fingers crossed that they won't need it next year. <laughs> I have my fingers crossed that they won't need a similar thing next year when that account yes. is open. Okay. okay, all those in favor of the transfer of $500,000 back to the school department, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, yes. action. Okay, now the appropriation uh, request from the town meeting, uh, from the uh, Town uh, is fifty million seven two nine nine six eight. Um, is there a motion? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Carol. Yes. I am uh, motivated to uh, make a recommendation, even though I strongly support the uh, growth factor increase of eight hundred eighty-five thousand um, dollars. I noticed that the aggregate amount of money that the, uh, what I'll call the unfunded uh, tuitions amount to is, uh, according to the calculation that I worked out, is $796,587. And, and I'm strongly motivated to make a motion <coughs> to um, reduce the budget by that amount. Um, but I'm going to pass and the hope that uh, we can save some money in the school department this year and use it for the special education uh, reserve fund um, for, before the end of the fiscal year. But I, I have to say that I'm continuously and extremely distressed by the lack of progress that the school department has made over addressing this huge amount of money that we are um, basically subsidizing uh, other communities for while we're asking the Arlington taxpayer to pay more. So um, this comment is not a motion. Is there any other discussion? Frank? Yeah, um, has anybody read the budget line by line and looked at it? Because I went through this and just looking at items, when we analyzed the other budgets, we pound them over $500, $400, and we're looking at $56 million. Um, I went through and highlighted items totaling somewhere between 1.4 and 1.6 million dollars where there's items that haven't been spent in the last three years, four years, where there's, I didn't, there's amounts listed here. Now, I'm going to say, I also understand that the school committee can spend it wherever they want, but there's items listed here and I just don't understand it. Any other discussion? 
Okay, all those in favor of the appropriation for 50 million seven two nine nine six eight, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so unanimous. And Dr. Bodia, I want to give you a call tomorrow, uh, the next couple of days, about some of the enrollment uh, uh, discrepancies I see between those two reporting mechanisms. So, uh, but I'll give you a call later on that. Okay. Uh, okay, it is now a couple minutes of 10. Uh, I had a talk with the manager on the three budget issues that we had mentioned, the snow and ice, uh, the uh, streets and street repairs, and the uh, cost-benefit analysis of the uh, recycling coordinator. Uh, they are in the process of preparing that, and they are hoping to come in on Wednesday. Uh, so I said if he, he's going to get back to me tomorrow. If that's the case, then that will be the first order of business uh, to go through those three issues. Uh, one issue I found is that when he calculates out the three and a half percent for his budgets, he includes all the non-school budgets. So, for example, on the snow budget, since about twenty thousand dollars was reduced out of the treasurer's <coughs> request, then that money, for example, could be shifted into snow and ice because uh, it's all within the same three and a half. So, just to let you know on that. Uh, and the other numbers, he's uh, he's going to be working on. Uh, so we'll do that. The next order of business uh, is Minuteman. Uh, there's two, two things there. The Minuteman appropriation, uh, you heard the budget presentation. Also, at the end, they handed out a sheet. Uh, so we want to rediscuss or revote the uh, Minuteman agreement. And you saw the, the sheet there with the four years of enrollment and doing it instead totally on enrollment, in other words, the weighted vote. It's going to be half on weighted vote and half equal. Uh, so that we'll discuss that and re, and re vote it. Um, uh, and then after that, we'll work on the budgets. Uh, and so uh, please, you know, everybody have all the rest of the budgets and we'll see how much we can get done. Uh, and, you know, maybe we don't need to meet, uh, meet both of uh, the days next week. Uh, is there any questions or any other business before the committee? What was the first thing on your on the list of three? Snow and ice, recycling and and the uh, street repairs. Oh, streets. Yeah. Streets. Okay, any other questions? Meeting adjourned. I just want to make one comment. I'm sorry. I did it. That budget, that special education item that uh, that Diane mentioned, and that um, in, the, in the object section, I did a four year compound growth analysis on that budget line, which was supposedly all the costs and things outside the district special education. And the compound growth rate is 5.3 percent from that from that uh, document. So I'm still totally confused on that question. You know, it, it could be that maybe what we need to do uh, before this is have a uh, you know another meeting with the uh, uh, maybe the school subcommittee on budgets could come in and we could just more have a more informal uh, discussion just on through going through the budgets mm -hmm. uh, so we're uh, you know we have a chance to have our budgets open and, and uh, maybe like I said do it a little bit more informal next year in other words have basically an additional session on that so okay any other yeah. okay thank you